Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. And the book is aimed at those working on their road cars, on their racing cars, or even developing alternative forms of transport. What I want to do in today's video is talk about measuring aerodynamic lift or downforce through pressure measurement. In previous videos, we've talked about measuring that in different ways, uh, ride height sensors, laser sensors, rotation of vortices, trailing vortices. In this video, I want to talk about looking at different pressures that are acting on top of the car and acting underneath the car. So as we've seen, the airflow, as it passes the car, develops pressures on the car's bodywork. And critically for developing lift, and remember 99.999% of road cars develop lift, critically for developing lift, it's the airflow wrapping around those upper curves on top of the car. We can see here the airflow wrapping around that big sweeping curve that develops lift forces, literally trying to lift the body up off the ground. Now counteracting those are the forces acting under the car, which if you do it correctly, will try and pull the car downwards. And if we get more pull downwards, then we get more pull upwards, then obviously we would get downforce. If we get more pulling upwards, then we get pulling downwards, then we would develop lift. Now, those pulls that I've been talking about, up and down, are caused by the pressures being developed on the car's bodywork. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. So what this computer graphic shows from Mercedes is the speed of the airflow. Now you might think, well, hold on, if you're doing 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour forwards and there's no crosswind, surely all the airflow speeds around the car must be at that speed, 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, but you'd be wrong. Because in fact, a car moving forward at that speed has on its bodywork airflow speeds that vary from zero, the air has been brought to a complete halt, to much faster than the car is moving forwards. So if we look at this graphic, where the hotter the color, the faster the airflow, we can see there a pretty cold color, blues, as the air is brought to a halt at the front of the car. But as it wraps around that leading edge of the bonnet or hood, it speeds up, it accelerates. Now, the faster the air is going, the lower the pressure that acts on the bodywork. So we can see at the very front of the bonnet or hood, there is typically a low pressure acting there. But look at what's happening over the top of the roof. We saw a moment ago the airflow wrapping around the roof, and I said that was developing lift forces. If we look here, we can see all those pressures are really low. They must be low because the airflow speed, velocity, is really, really fast. So if we look at our bodywork and we could see with our bare eyes the aerodynamic pressures that are acting on the bodywork, we would be able to see those lift forces trying to pull the car up. And if we were able to see those pressures under the car, we would see those forces trying to pull the car downwards. And it's that balancing act which results in whether the car has overall lift or downforce. Remember, the faster the airflow speed, the lower the pressure that's actually acting on the bodywork. So we do have the ability to see those pressures. In my book, I cover in some detail how you can actually measure those aerodynamic pressures that are acting on the bodywork. And here on this Tesla Model 3, I have measured the pressures along the center line of the bodywork. So just as we saw a moment ago at the front, there's a high pressure where the air is brought to a halt, plus 210, we'll just call them units. As the airflow wraps around the early part, the front part of the hood or bonnet, minus 47, less than atmospheric, a minus pressure is pulling on the bodywork, a plus pressure is pushing on the bodywork. We can see as we go across the top of the roof, again, a car with a lovely curve all the way across, minus 40, pulling, minus seven, 179, not just 79, 179, pulling upwards, minus 192, pulling, minus 155, pulling upwards. Well, lots of pull upwards from those low pressures. What about under the car? Are there any other pull downwards? Well, we can see here minus 136, so that's pulling downwards by that amount, but here only minus 72. 
Remember, the miners under the car is pulling downwards, the miners on top of the car is pulling upwards. And you can see if we just look at that number and we look at the numbers up here, it's quite likely this car develops a lot of lift. Now, we have to go one more step though, because the actual force that's developed depends not only on the pressure, but the area over which it is acting. Let's have a look at that in the next graphic. So what I've done here is I've measured again center line pressures. This is on one of my cars, a Honda Insight. It's a heavily modified Insight, which actually develops downforce. It develops downforce primarily through the shaped under trays under the car. But what I've done is I've drawn arrows and the length of the arrow is proportional to the pressures. So the longer arrow means a greater pressure, in this case, a low pressure. The direction the arrow points in is where that force is acting, where that pull is acting. So we can see on top of the roof, the pull is directly upwards. The pull always acts at right angles to the panel. We can see at the back of the roof, it's still largely upwards because the, the roof is only gently sloping. Under the car, where the panels are pretty well parallel to the road, you can see the pulls are directly downwards. So on this shot here, we can see the front under tray is creating a good pull downwards. It's working aerodynamically very well. The middle under trays are not developing that big a pull downwards. That's probably because there's an exhaust pipe in the way and you can't have a flat under tray right across. And the rear diffuser, the upward sloping panel at the back on this heavily modified car is also developing a downwards pull. Now, looking at the arrows and looking at the areas over which those pressures would be acting, we could say, yeah, I reckon, I reckon this car probably develops downforce because there's more area with bigger lengths of arrows, if you like, under the car than it is on top. But we can do another little trick to see that more clearly. And that is, whoops, let's go back to that slide, having some difficulties there. That is, we draw a line that connects the top of the arrows. Now, these were all arrows pulling upwards, developing low pressures. This arrow here was actually developing a high pressure, so it was pushing into the bodywork. And that arrow there is developing a low pressure where the airflow wraps around the bonnet. So we color, just very roughly, doesn't matter, does it? We color in this sort of purpley uh, gray color, the area that's being pulled upwards and we cover in this green squiggle there and all the way across here, the area that's in this case pulling downwards. And there you can see much more clearly, there's a lot more green squiggle area than there is gray purple squiggle area. In other words, the pressure multiplied by the area showing the force direction in this case indicates that there car, this car is developing actual downforce. And by measuring through suspension deflection sensors, POTS that we've covered in other videos, that also is evidence that this car develops downforce. So we can get a really good feel. It's not perfectly accurate, but we can get a really good feel for whether the car is developing lift or downforce by looking at the pressures acting under the car and the pressures acting on top of the car and then actually having a feel for the areas those pressures are acting uh, over by the use of this, this colored it, coloring in approach. And the, the benefit of this over the other techniques that uh, I've described is it can be done at low speeds. You don't have to go really fast and it can be done on cars with stiff suspension. Remember when we were measuring ride height changes, the stiffer the suspension, the less there is a ride height change for a given aerodynamic up or down force. So it makes it really hard if the car's got really stiff suspension. However, this approach will give only an approximate result. Uh, if you wanted to make a lot of measurements, maybe hundreds, and, and see the areas over which each of those pressures were acting and then uh, work out what the vertical component was of each of those forces, you could make it far more accurate, but that's a huge amount of work. Better to do it in another way. So this approach would normally be done only as part of a broader pressure measuring testing. In other words, you're already measuring pressures to find out something else, how well a rear spoiler worked or how well an under tray worked or something like that. 
And then you could look at the pattern of pressures and say, well, okay, I can get a pretty good feel for whether this car is developing lift or downforce. I'm already measuring the pressures. Why not look at that as well? All covered in my book. The book is out now. It's available from Amazon in your country. 500 pages, over 800 coloured graphs, uh, photographs and charts. Not a cheap book, can't really be with uh, that, that page count and, and full colour, but I think you'll find it gives you far more guidance and far more test techniques so that when you are aerodynamically modifying or developing, you've got a much better idea of where you're going. I would think you would save the purchase cost of the book in the very first modification that you make that works. Thank you.